The Africa Centre means a haven, a place in London where you can experience the best of Africa. Uh, it's a hub, it's a, a gathering of people who have a common interest in the African continent. There is an African renaissance in arts, in culture, in music, um, in the film industry. And we feel that the Africa Centre, going forwards, should be the hub, should be the lead, leading place that will showcase, I would say, the innovative creativity of the, of the continent as it is today. It's always been a, a meeting point for both Africans in Africa and also, you know, Africans in the diaspora. So the legacy of the African Centre, you know, is a, is a very, very important one. The future will involve more business-related activities for the Africa Centre. Um, there's a whole new uh, African entrepreneur coming up and we want to engage with them. We want to deal with corporates. Um, corporates, obviously, Africa now People keep talking about Africa rising, of course it's a little bit of a tired phrase, but the corporates are very interested in Africa, so we want also to be a bridge, a business bridge to Africa from the corporate world in the in the Europe, in the in US, in China. So the African Center needs to be a hub of activity, of business and cultural activity, a center for people to engage with. Um, changing the face, vibe, perspective that many people have uh, about Africa uh, into a positive one so I am happy to be part of that. Festivals like this are absolutely essential in representing Africa in London because the news, you know, portrays Africa as, you know, very needy, lots of wars and things like that. And there are many challenges, but it's not the only thing. There are amazing things happening in Africa and amazing art and amazing culture. That's what we should be celebrating because when you go to Africa, that's what you see. Thank you, Henry. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to be here today, really, really deep pleasure, to participate in a conference on such a live and important issue as the need for the change in narrative about the African continent. I'm proud and honored to be participating today, first of all, as an African myself, affected by the thorny issues of how the world perceives us, and secondly, as a representative of the Africa Center, a co-sponsor of today's event. The title of this session, after much deliberation, changing the conversation, was chosen which, by Caitlin from Soaz and myself to reflect the Africa Center's role today in changing perceptions of Africa within the UK. Over the past 50 years, the relevance of the Africa Center has evolved from being a major forum on pan-African activism in the UK in the 70s, the 80s, promoting and championing struggles for independence, to becoming a platform for promoting Africa's cultural diversity and socio-economic development in the 80s and 90s. Now in the 21st century, the Africa Center recognizes its great potential to become an ideological hub, a space in which African innovation and development can and should converge. The Africa Center should be and is a facilitator for fostering the exchange of ideas and debate and nurturing the creativity that is transforming and powering the continent into a force to be reckoned with and respected on the global stage. The Africa Center must, with greatest respect to its past, look to the future now and serve the interests of the current and future generations. By that I mean myself and my children and your children and yourselves. Serve the interests of those of us who are outside the continent and who need to be heard, seen and recognized as contributors with an equal stake in shaping the next 50 years, both of the Africa Center and of Africa. Let's set about changing the conversation just as we're starting to do today. 
each of us should leave here today making a commitment, as we have done at the Africa Centre, to influence and transform that negative and stereotypical image of our continent of poverty, hunger and war by showcasing our talent, our entrepreneurship, our good citizenship, our bold innovation, so that it becomes a norm rather than the exception. Not just a feel-good, once-in-a-while news story, but a consistent theme that Africa is truly, forgive the cliche, truly rising. Now, in researching this controversial topic of the negative reporting, I'm not a journalist, by the way, I'm a lawyer. So when I was asked to come and participate, I thought, well, let's find, let me find out online about what's been said, what's been debated. What are the experts saying about the way the media is reporting Africa? And I found a whole host of online newspaper articles. It's been debated for the past 10 years. I was surprised. I was surprised as it's been debated, and we've made some progress, but in my opinion, not enough. And there again, I see a role for the Africa Center. Now, one particular article that I will quote from, and I will so I'm not accused of plagiarism, give due um, recognition to the journalist Remy Adikoya, who published an article on the 20th of November 2013 in The Guardian Online, and made very few but pertinent observations, which really resonated with me personally, as someone who's living and has lived in the UK for 20 years. I quote, Africans living abroad fret about the perception of their continent and its inhabitants because their future often depends on the opinions of Africa held by those in the countries in which they reside. I'm Nigerian, and I remember 10, 15 years ago, the FT was running an article about how a lot of the credit card scams and frauds were being perpetrated by Nigerians, and only Nigerians, and mostly Nigerians, and forever Nigerians. And therefore, Nigerians who worked in the finance industry started to say <coughs> they were British and actually hide the fact of who they were because it stereotyped us as people who are only good at one thing. The other quote I will say is, each major news item presenting Africa in a negative light is viewed by Africans as something that will make their working lives that bit harder. And again, take the recent media coverage about the Ebola virus outbreak in three countries, in Guinea, in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in West Africa. Now that coverage and the, I would say, irresponsible media coverage in the US caused havoc in the lives of Africans living and working in that country. And those are just little examples of what Africans have to experience in their day-to-day -day lives, really because of the media's narrative. And that media may be the international media, may be the domestic African media, but it's still a problem that we take home and sleep with and wake up with every morning. Let's be honest, Africa, like the rest of the world, has its own challenges, but these are not the only stories to be told. The same newspaper article commented, the continent currently has no microphone of its own on the global stage, no loudspeaker with which to tell its stories the way it wants them to be told. It has to wait in line, hoping others lend its, lends its theirs from time to time. That won't do. The Africa Center today is uniquely placed to be that microphone, to be that loudspeaker for the continent on the global stage, starting within the UK. We are the focal point at the Africa Center for a dynamic international Africa, and will always seek to raise the profile of Africa and of Africans by providing a meeting place where ideas and endeavors can be exchanged and celebrated. When I say we, I mean every one of us in this room, because we are all the Africa Center. How will the Africa Center play a role in changing the conversation? Our programming will reflect innovation in arts, culture, music, film, and fashion. Our flagship annual Africa Summer Festival in Covent Garden is fast becoming the most attend event for those wishing to experience firsthand the best of Africa's talent. By nurturing excellence and entrepreneurship, particularly in the creative sector, we are proud supporters of the annual African Creative Industry Summit. By supporting initiatives such as today, aimed at raising the profile of Africa, whilst engaging in constructive debate on critical issues that still hinder socioeconomic development. We're proud supporters in today's event and really are grateful for the opportunity given to us by SOAS and by RAS to participate and be really, really part of the conversation. And we'll continue to hold this space 
responsibly from this day onward. We also are proud supporters of TEDx, and we've done that for two years in a row. The Africa Centre will continue to listen, communicate, and engage with stakeholders, with our friends, our audience, and all of those who have a genuine interest in the advancement of the African continent to ensure we keep our finger on the pulse of change to remain relevant to the conversation. We already see that young Africans are using social media to challenge neg negative stereotypical images of Africa that reflect badly on us all. And we thank them for it. And we follow their lead. The Africa Centre is actively engaging in this changing conversation online and will continue to provide the much needed platform and loudspeaker for all of you and myself and our children and all those young activists out there for the new and rising Africa Centre in the 21st century. I'm going to just end on a proverb. If you've got a copy of our brochure, which if you haven't, I hope you will pick up from the desk outside. It's just a brochure that tells you a bit about our story and hopefully will encourage you to participate in the journey that we're on. The proverb in our brochure says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We recognize the next 50 years of the Africa Center is a journey we need to embark on collectively. Together, we are stronger. We also acknowledge that only irreversible economic development can transform global perceptions about African countries. A final quote from that same newspaper article. Nothing burnishes reputation quite as quickly as success. Thank you very much. Briefly, Bimpe, I mean, um, a lot of people, um, obviously, especially in this room, will have uh, memories of the Africa Centre, and then they're not quite clear, perhaps not till the last few minutes, what it's going to become, which direction it's going to go. So are we saying that rather than focusing on a building, which people were doing for a long time, it's now about supporting and enabling African initiatives, especially in the creative industries, or well-meaning conferences like this? Is that what the future is going to really be about? Um, it's about both. I mean, we, we, you know, I'm African, I live in London, I, my children are growing up here. I, we, we do need to support the initiatives, we do need to be part of the conversation. But we need a place, we need a place to gather. Mm -hmm. Just as the Africa Centre in, you know, I, I didn't study here in the 60s, but I guess my parents did, and they will talk, and most people will talk about, the, with nostalgia, about going there and meeting friends and, and being that home away from home. The point is, though, that there are a lot of places in London where you can go to experience African food, African music, and shows, theatre, film. So in those days, it was probably the only place. But we still need a, a gathering place, we need a hub, to, a place to come together to exchange ideas. Mm -hmm. First of all, it would be more economical for various institutions and organisations to have one place, one home, where they can come and use together and mm -hmm. share the costs, and that's an economic factor. But at the same time, we need a building we can put our stamp on and a building and a place that we can call home. Mm -hmm. What kind of building are you thinking of? Because I remember with the BCA Heritage, formerly Black Cultural Archives, which is in Brixton, people were wondering about what that place that they now have, the Heritage Rally Hall, should do, you know? Because, I mean, it goes up quite high, but it doesn't go out very far. And if you remember the old Africa Center, of course, it was a very tall building, but very, very narrow. So it restricted what you could do in terms of performances, in terms of gallery space, etc. So, form and content, what are you thinking? Again, the building has to fit our vision. I hope I've articulated it enough mm. sufficiently today. But it has to be a fit-for-purpose building. When you travel on the continent of Africa today, you will find amazing spaces for experiencing art, food, hotels, and there's no reason why a building in London should not be as befitting and as special as some of the spaces that we can find in Dakar, in Nairobi, in Lagos, in Johannesburg. So we've got to make it a building that works for the Africans who want to use it, who have a choice. And that's one thing, London gives us a lot more choice. London is so culturally diverse, you mm -hmm. don't have to be stuck in one postcode to find Africa. So we've got to make it a place that everyone wants to come to, but a place that can house small enough events. I mean, we can't mm -hmm. compete with the South Bank or the Barbican, but we want to be able to have intimate meetings, book readings, we want to have lectures, we want to have talks like this, 100, 150 people, but we want space, again, to be financially sustainable. Mm -hmm. We can hire out, we can make into smaller rooms, bigger spaces, we can use for other things, apart from our own programs. 
and we can also invite other institutions who are Africa focused and other businesses who are Africa focused to come in and have you know meetings and conferences as well so we multi-use is the thing in the right place that is it will become a destination okay do you have a borough in mind I mean, uh, my own borough of Lambeth is, is, is welcoming to Africans. I mean, there are many, there are many of us there for a while. Um, if you don't like uh, SW9, you can uh, try Southwark, I suppose. There's lots of Nigerians there. You'll, be, you'll feel welcome. You no, know, no, no, no. Those are boroughs oh. that we are looking at. Really? Uh, absolutely. Because, oh. you know, London again, central London 20, 25 years ago was two or three postcodes. Central London now is, now I've discovered myself, is, is, you know, where the White Cube Gallery is, Bermondsey. London Bridge is central, London Borough Market is, mm -hmm. yeah, Camden is, you know, so, boroughs, like you mentioned, are all mm -hmm. part of where we're looking. Also, with, you know, the cost of real estate, one needs to make sure it's a building that is financially sustainable, that's not over, we're not going to be paying over our ass for something we can't maintain. Mm -hmm. But yes, we also need a building that's easy to get to. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things, that, things I feel very strongly about for the Africa Center to be is not is a harbor, a home for Africans, but a place where non-Africans who have no knowledge and have never interacted with Africa or Africans can find easily, can get up the tube and it might be in a destination that they're on their way somewhere and they think, wow, what's this building? Mm -hmm. And that's what the Covent Garden Summer Festival has become. The first year we held it, I, you know, I was standing there just sort of, you know, being my little spy and listening to American tourists, French tourists, you know, I speak French, sort of saying, wow, what's going on here? You know, London is amazing. You know, you can, we're coming to come and garden to the Apple store. We didn't think we'd find Africa here. <laughs> and that's, you, you know, we want us to be everywhere and in everybody's faces and people who don't normally see us interact with us. And that's how we can change that perception. Because if they've only seen the negative news on the TV and suddenly they see this amazing African fashion designer or artist or young musician, on stage, they're going to also understand, like you said earlier, that there are two sides to every story. Mm -hmm. And so we need it to be in a place where people can get to, and that's the most important. But London does have transport links, so we're looking at various postcodes. Tremendous. Obviously, for a long time, people were going on and talking you know, with great passion and feeling ab about the building. I think everyone accepts that that story's gone and we've moved to something else. So people are now wondering, OK, so uh, we need to hear the Africa Centre. They need to be louder. They need to be... Um, where everybody knows what they're doing sort of thing. Absolutely. And so the building's only part of it. What about shouting much more loudly about, about Africa, about Africans in the UK, about who we are and what we're doing? Absolutely, and shouting online. I mean, we've, we have, an, I would say, a great team, a small team at the moment, who have also are younger than I am and who have actually educated us very much about the virtues of, an, of the online um, sort of conduit and platform. And so that's one area that with the Africa Centre was totally absent you know, up to now, and we're exploring that space. So online, social media, but definitely being part of events, you know, supporting where we can, participating, but really being part of the conversation that, as far as we're con concerned, is showcasing the contemporary, the, you know, the, the new, the good news about Africa. I think there's a lot of other people showing the bad news. We'll, we'll, the bad news, we'll talk about, we'll debate, we'll analyze, we'll try and give our own, you know, solutions. Mm -hmm but I think we want to focus more on the good news. Fantastic. So when uh, the Nigerian election takes place next month, can I expect to see you on Newsnight discussing it? it, it may not Evan be, Davis? It, it, it may not be me. Um, okay. uh, Henry, don't forget I'm a trustee. It's not a full-time job. Yes, 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 <laughs> so, yes, yes, yes. But what we are doing is we, we are, as much as possible, um, ensuring that we can reach out and form partnerships with other bodies, with other institutions, with other leaders, thought leaders, people who are, not, who are experts in areas that you know, us trustees are not. And it may be that we invite them and ask them to speak and vocalize some of the thoughts or, or lead the debate that we want to be part of. Because we can't, we're not going to reinvent the wheel, but we want to just make, make sure that we facilitate and support and push forward on certain areas that we think are key as Africans. Fantastic. And uh, the money you recouped for the sale of the building is being managed well by some excellent uh, fund managers, yes? It's intact. The capital is there, and we're pretty, very, 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 being very prudent. I mean, finding a building is one. Yes. A building that will be financially sustainable, ensuring that there is good financial management around whatever funds we have, and building an endowment fund. And that's the, that's the future of the Africa Centre. Bimpen Kochu, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. What a day it's been. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, last night I had... Um, I did kind of wake up about 4 a.m. and think... 
Oh dear. <laughs> but I've been absolutely delighted. It's been, it's been really inspiring. And um, of course, there are a lot of questions that have been um, left resonating in my mind. And um, I think they're things that a generation ago that some of them would have probably have been asked, but some of them are within those questions are possibly some potential solutions, some positive narratives that we might be able to tie together, to weave together into something that hopefully will create a momentum that we can go away with. And that's what I'm hoping from this plenary that we can um, begin to do. And it's going to be about you. I mean, we're hoping that this will be an opportunity for more um, questions, but also potentially um, some solutions, some suggestions from the floor. Um, and we've got um, a fantastic panel. We welcome back Bimpe, but also um, Catherine, um, Sylvie, um, um, Agnes, Agnes, um, Ola, and, um, and, and, and Magnus. Um, and I mean, it's been a great day. Um, I, what, what, would you, what would you take away from today, Agnes? For me, it's their money, our story. Okay, so from here, what I think um, sort of I've taken today is about connectivity, the Africa diaspora, investment and development of the African media, but also innovation. If we are to make any sense, if we are to contribute to, to the African narrative, the rising story, we must be innovative. The, the old media is dying, so we must come with new ways of telling our story, but it will take each one of us. And I think another very important thing that the media has failed is to sort of be part of the integration. Africa is selling itself as, as one economic block. Can we have one block, the African media, but it will take a lot of us, it will take us investing in African media and also Africans consuming the African story. So we must be able, if I'm looking for a story about African investment, I don't have to go to the FT. Can I go to the, to the Kenyan media or to the Nigerian media to learn about, about, about um, Africa? So investment and quality reporting for me. And, and, and so would you get a, a sense that, that there are the um, constituent parts to actually make that possible? I mean, is the, I can imagine that there is, of course, there's the, the will, but is there the infrastructure? Is there the, is I, there the means? Uh, yes, I think there are two basic problems here. I do not see... Um, I, 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 I haven't seen an awareness of the fact that ma the media are actually crucial to development. The fact is, we heard a lot about people complaining about the marginalization of um, African journalists and African topics in mainstream Western media. That's true, but we also have a lot of uh, professionals of African descent from whom we heard today. I think rather than focus on uh, the problems we still have, we need to ensure that we use the human and other resources we already have to contribute to the development of Africa and African communities. And uh, we must understand that it's not enough to report on, on Boko Haram or report on wars in Africa <clears throat> and so on and so on. That is fiddling while Africa is burning. I believe that we Africans and African diaspora must understand that we have a duty and an opportunity in the 21st century to ensure that we develop, protect, and build the African continent and African communities that have been abused by others and also the African elites for many, many centuries. I know it's a heavy burden, but I tell you this, we will not be sitting here today if an African journalist had not taken up that burden and fulfilled his duty. That journalist was called Joseph Kazili Hayford, and I am not mentioning him just because his wonderful grandson happens to be chairing this meeting. <laughs> the fact is, it was at a simple conference like this one in 1912 that he and Booker T. Washington decided 
to actively promote Pan-Africanism. And we know what Pan-Africanism has done for Africa and the African diaspora. And what, above all, a big generator of news it was throughout the 20th century. And my point is, let's fulfill our duty towards Africa and the African continent and African communities in the diaspora as well. If we want to generate stories that are of interest to the media and the world. And I know you mentioned uh, the lack of means. With due respect, I do not believe at all that there is any problem with financial resources. And as I was saying earlier, please do not mistake me for one of these millionaires who tell people that, poor people that money is not going to make them happy. I, <laughs> I speak to you. I speak to you as the director of the Policy Center for African Peoples, which operates from a shed in her garden in the, the Kent countryside, and that shed also doubles as her gym, because she, do, <laughs> she does not yet have the infrastructure she needs to operate in central London, which is her aim. But from that shed, I help the African Union raise over... $100 million, $100 million in three weeks hmm, in order to combat Ebola in West Africa, just by picking up the phone and uh, lobbying business people all over the world. So it can be done. It can be done. <laughs> Sylvie's my new best friend. <laughs> 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 I like to follow. Yes, it really is, Catherine. But if there is potentially that money, and mm -hmm. I, I know it's going to be difficult to, 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 to leverage, to prize out of the hands of the people who have it, but what needs to be done on the continent and also beyond mm -hmm. to make the necessary changes so that we can create really sustainable change? Um, I think... There are, uh, the African media faces a lot of challenges that are the same as the media all over the world. They have challenges around finding profitable business models, finding advertising revenue in an increasingly you know, competitive space. Uh, they also face the business challenges that many other businesses in Africa face. You know, how do they get reliable internet? How do they have reliable power supply? How can they get good telephone lines in in order to be able to carry out those interviews? So I think there's a, a tremendous amount that needs to be done, but I think there are a lot of initiatives that have been set up which are trying to address those issues. Um, at Africa Practice, which is the company that I, I work for, which is a, a communications consultancy, we work with a couple of players in the private sector who are trying to do their bit um, as, as investors in Africa to, to give something back to the media, which is such a critical voice on the continent. So, for example... Um, Bloomberg, which I think was being discussed quite a bit today in terms of their reporting, but they also have a, a foundation called Bloomberg Philanthropies, which has just launched a big um, program to train financial journalists in Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya, um, in recognition of the fact that um, in order to be able to do good business and financial reporting, you know, you need to be able to, to read a balance sheet, you need to be able to understand statistics, you need to be able to know which databases to go to to find out the information that you need. And I think that kind of targeted programming that really focuses on, on skills is really a, an essential element. And I think it's important that, um, you know, it's, it, it's not forgotten about in the, in the rush to focus too much on representation and narratives, which is important, but actually day-to-day -day skills and, and business models are just as important as, um, as the, the, me the message that's being delivered. Hmm. And Magnus, do you think there are other things that could be done to build capacity to create sustainability? Um, yeah, I, I agree with much of what you've just said, Catherine. I think um, one of the key points is creating a vision of what a sustainable um, domestic journalism system looks like in many African countries. Uh, I don't know if this has been mentioned much today, but many journalists in African countries can't really afford to be journalists or journalists exclusively as their only job because the pay is so bad. I work with a really interesting organisation called the... Well, um, I work for the Royal African Society, but we, we collaborate with an organisation called the David Astor Journalism Awards Trust, which takes really great young journalists in East Africa, brings them over to the UK, 
helps develop their careers with the intention of giving them opportunities to write internationally where the money is better than often um, they'll get for a, you know, a developing career in, in one of the East African countries in which they work. But this is a, a great initiative, but I always think it, it looks externally, and what we need to be doing is to creating um, sustainable careers within the region rather than constantly looking outside of the region um, for the better money. Um, the problem is, um, particularly in this changing media world, is that newspapers particularly don't make money, which we've mentioned earlier. Um, and we're going to have to think innovatively through um, how people consume news and consume analysis, maybe through micropayments uh, um, via their mobile phone, which has obviously been a real innovation in Eastern Africa. So I think there are lots of opportunities now to make the, this new media environment sustainable, um, both in Africa and globally, but people are going to have to really think creatively about that and not just stick to the old model of, of news consumption and production that um, is uh, being essentially phased out at the moment. And it's an interesting new model that seems to be taking shape. I mean, Ola, do you feel optimistic about, about that? And very much so. Um, I was a journalist in the 80s, and I'm now a scholar. So I know what it means um, to actually experience practicing in an um, atmosphere that sometimes is very, very hostile. Um, what I want to say for the future is that journalism has got a future. There's no, 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 no doubt about it. But <coughs> Africans have to change their conceptual map of Africa, the way we perceive Africa. Yeah. See the point? And you could be in Africa and actually not know Africa very well. Mm -hmm. yeah, because, um, you know, growing up in Nigeria in the 60s, 70s, and things like that, you know, I actually valued Western ideas and concepts and way of life more than I did Nigerian one. And thanks to the Russians, actually, because I went, I got a scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my scholarship took me to Moscow State University. And after learning the Russian language, the first thing they asked me was, um, tell us about your culture. Man, I was in my mid-twenties, and I knew nothing <laughs> about my culture. So that was a big shock, you know. So getting over that and things like that. So we need to change our conceptual map. And based on the question that you've raised today, it is their money, definitely. And the story is ours. However, it is being told from an ideological and cultural lens, which is not ours. You see the point? <laughs> so, so, and Tabo Mbeki actually made a statement about 10 years ago and said the African media have to actually redefine African narrative. And we should now begin to do a lot of that. The technology has given us the means to do that. You know, I now study, because I've been living outside of Africa for almost 30 years now. And I felt, let me study African media within the diaspora. You see the point? So for those of you who have not seen my book before, this is <laughs> very <laughs> <No>? good. <laughs> what, 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 newspaper, what newspapers, films, and television do Africans living in Britain see and read? You know, So you could get a copy from the Amazon. <laughs> And, and that's focusing on the Africans. And then um, the editor of one of the newspapers that I actually um, you know, study, um, Mr. Mike Abiola, the editor of African uh, Voice is here. I invited him yesterday. I said, I'm coming to London. And he said, oh, you got to be there. So it's, it's an incredible moment for things to happen. What I will throw to the, to the floor as a food, uh, food for thought is what is the role of the Africans in the diaspora in making things happen. You see? Because there is a big gap there. Then the second thing is that, what is the role of the African diasporic journalists and their media in also changing the perception of Africa? I will leave that to the floor so that we can. I mean, it's also a question, Bimpe, that you might want to answer, because isn't, aren't those the questions that are pretty core to the, um, the remit of the Africa Centre. Absolutely. Um, I mean, speaking on behalf of, this is, we're in the third sector here, so this is, we're a charity, but at the same time, we recognise that there is a need for some, um, you know, leadership 
in trying to to look at what the next steps are. Because w when I was speaking earlier, I mean, I was very concerned about the fact that, like I said, I researched online and there's been a lot of debate and conferences and talk shops about this same topic over the last 10 years. And I didn't realize that we hadn't made that much progress. So someone somewhere has to, together with someone like Sylvie in her Kent hut, needs to <laughs> champion this and move things forward. Because I really would like to, in a year or two, be again uh, an audience in a conference like this saying, now this is what has happened since that last time. Now, where can the Africa Center um, fit in? What can we do? And I, I, I see a role. It's always a role in this, even through the t third sector. It may not be, obviously, in you know, funding or investing in, in, in TV channels or in newspapers. But I would look at the same way that we have um, an audience of Africans in diaspora who are working in various sectors, in, in film, in media, and in business, there is a, an opportunity here for us to leverage the Africa Center's audience and contacts to perhaps look for a way of supporting investigative journalism. Um, and I think, let us, even if, even if what the, the part of that big uh, um, piece of cake that we need to sort of allot responsibility for, one part for me is having some more human interest stories. Good feeling, part of, somebody mentioned earlier, bringing the history of Africa into mainstream journalism, whether through fiction or fact or a blend of both, just to educate our generation and the ones coming afterwards. Now, if we were able to support some a way of raising funds for a grant of some sort to get a, a good investigation journalism sort of grants out there on an annual basis to support some good stories. That I think will help in changing the narrative. In the financial and business sector, there's been a big leap in the way Bloomberg or Reuters represent Africa. If you want to invest in any stock market in, in Africa, you will punch online and you will find tons of information and data about you know, what stocks are doing and who's the CEO of this company and the banks and their CEO summits in London, Geneva, till you're blue in the face that obviously show that there is African business interest. But nobody is doing anything to actually tell stories about, you know, that entrepreneur, that you know, town or, you know, in, in Nairobi or what was happening in Lagos, in the film industry, in schools or what have you. So there should be a way to support some young journalists who want to just focus on investigative journalism to bring that possibly online. That might be the less expensive way of doing it. But I think the Africa Center can actually champion a movement in creating a new narrative in that direction. I'm going to... I mean, I I, okay, sorry. sorry. <laughs> just carry, carry on. One, one quick point and no, I want no, to open just, it up. Just to highlight what uh, Bimpe is saying, that yes. it is really very, very important to have a specific action plan in terms of the next steps that she is proposing. Because again and again, we usually come together, we talk, 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 and then nothing concrete happens. Yes. Well, if, if, I think, Sylvie, if you're prepared to um, think about ways in which we can coordinate some actions that come out of today, <clears throat> I think that would be enormously <laughs> useful. I think particularly as you seem such a resourceful person who can... Who can millions. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I, I do but think that this is, this, is, this is a part... That this is a, essentially, it's about, to some degree, stopping talking and actually us all getting up and actually doing things. And the, 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 the passion in this space and the ideas, I think that there is the potential to build some momentum... Here and I think you know it's something that we shouldn't we shouldn't waste. But I do want to open up to to the floor because what I really want to, us to go away with at the end of today is a sense the, of of some forward momentum. You know, it may not be that we have answers, but it might be that we're beginning to ask some really kind of you know focused questions. Please, questions from the floor. Um, my name is Tokumboy Fachiroti. Um, it's just a proposal. Since we're talking about the African continent, is there a way that we can probably link up with the maybe educational departments of the 54 countries, find out um, what each school is doing in terms of if they have league, maybe leagues, and, and then create, as it were, maybe like being said, an online academy or something, 
whereby we seek for funding if we can't get funding or we do crowdfunding or just to get some money and then we train individuals who show that they want to move into journalism or media and then this Bloomberg that you were talking about, kind that you were talking about, send those people forth to get more training and then they will be the ones who, because they're already living in these countries on the African continent, be a better mouthpiece to voice out exactly what is going on on ground and infuse it with the training that they're getting from Bloomberg. I think if we look inward instead of always looking outward, we can begin to make a pathway but as it stands now, you know, a lot of us in the diaspora come together and we talk about the woes, the things that are not happening. And to a larger extent, we do this and it's covered by the media so that maybe the government back home will see what is going on and begin to make a change. But from my experience, nobody really has time for that. It has to really come from us. So if we can all come together and make this happen, then we take it to the state governments of all these countries and say, this is what we want our youth to be doing now. Because as it stands, nobody's looking out for the future. And these youth are really the people who will be leading us 10, 15 years down the line. So I think if we do it in that way, then the face of media can begin to change. And the kind of news that we want to be coming out showcasing you know, good leadership skills, teamwork, commitment, and dedication to work. We become rife as opposed to the negativity which we tend to hear much more often than we really need to. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that? Can, can I just say a, a point? Um, if you're a, a journalist and you want to work as a freelancer and you want to work on... on any African country or the entire continent, you need to know that you've got lots of outlets that you can pitch your articles to and get a decent amount of money to make your career sustainable. So um, there are lots of organisations, generally small trusts and grant-making organisations, that will support investigative work. So I actually think this is a really good idea if the Africa Centre were to put a load of money up and say, we will sponsor this many investigative projects per year um, and make a big deal about that as well to show that there's a, a place that um, people can actually go to and think about writing about a story about an African country rather than going for um, kind of easier topics. If you're a freelancer, you want to know that there's some way that you can actually, to put it crudely, make money uh, by being a, a journalist on Africa. Um, so I would really kind of commend that kind of um, initiative that that is, already happens, but not so much with an Africa focus. It's generally with an investigative journalism focus or with a, some other kind of thematic focus. Mm. Agnes, did you? Sure, that's a very important point about education. And I, I think instead of reinventing the wheel, there are already initiatives out there, but they're so divided. What we need to do is find one voice. There's Africa Media Initiative already based in Nairobi but tries to develop that capacity African media capacity and you know the most surprising thing for me is that we have these grants none of them from Africans we have Bloomberg, we have Diageo that really supports Africa reportage in Africa business reporting, S.A.B. Miller so we need to see Africans putting their money where their mouth is. We have to see blaming the Western media. In exactly. fact, the Western media has actually shaped the Africa rising story. We need to sort of, how can we coordinate that effort? How can we have a united agenda, a united agenda towards Africa reported? And I think that's the way forward. And as African in the diaspora, it is an opportunity we cannot afford to lose. We need to grasp it now because 10 years from now, it will not be there. The Africa rising story is only with us for a very short time. If we don't grasp it, our young children, our generation to come will still have to to struggle with identity, you know, with the issue of misrepresentation. So let's coordinate our efforts, let's work together as African and cease complaining and put our money where our mouth is. Ms. Sylvie, that I would love to see the sorts of resources that you're talking about actually in some way plug into the sorts of things that, that, that Magnus is, is talking about. Um, but do you feel that there are the sorts of figures who would invest in these kinds of programs, who would be open to potentially the ramifications? There's a kind of, there's, there has to be a sense of 
um, I don't know, you would have to be able to let go of the ramifications or the repercussions that come from that investment to some degree because part of, part of it may well be that there, these individuals may well be criticising the companies that are funding some of these programmes. Oh yes, but <laughs> I think there are two, uh, two things that I may say in response to your question. Number one, as Agnes was saying earlier, there is money. There is already money there. Then what we need to do is to learn how to make the case. If there is already, as I mentioned earlier, someone like Dr. Mo Ibrahim, we know that he is interested in supporting a specific agenda, which is democracy. If we want a project and we, we, we want to do something that is how to support dictatorial Africans, he won't support it. But if we have a project there, as we were saying, how to promote freedom of expression or the fact that there are already some journalists that are being killed in Africa, let's make a, 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 a proper case. The, the, the thing I was saying earlier this morning is that I have written to several people in a position of power, I will attempt not to mention any names, to say I cannot do everything alone. Mm. Let's come together and let's have a proper action plan. Eh? We know where Obasanjo is. We know that he has money. We know where... Uh, 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 did I say I wasn't going to mention any names? <laughs> and we know... We know where all these people operate. Then if each one of us, because it's about who you know and how to, you talk to these people, we know the people who go to Davos. But if we go to Davos just to uh, 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 what is being done in, in Davos without our own action plan, I, I, I swear I, I give only one specific example and I stop there. Uh, right now, we know that President Obama is a very good news story. Imagine a group of us, members of the African diaspora and people on the ground in Nigeria, approaching him with a specific action plan to say this is what we, we think should be done to uh, uh, end with Boko Haram. And don't tell me that it is impossible because I have already done studies on that. And imagine, do you think people are not going to, to listen to that story and President Obama is not going to listen to us? That's something I will be very happy to, to, to help because I already have a project with him in September this year. But what I can do is the man has given me his trust on a specific project and suddenly I start bothering his team again with the African media. And I have approached people here in a position of power. I said, I am doing this in September. What can you do for the terrorism or media and blah, blah, blah? Nobody has taken notice. That's the problem. But genuinely, if, if we can build this kind of momentum, I mean... Raise your hand if you would be prepared to come together as a working group to begin to think about how one would actually progress some of the things that Sylvie would, would say. See? Give me a look. Does that fill you with optimism? Definitely, definitely. You see, <laughs> yes. um, um, there are many challenges to telling African stories, okay? And I will talk from the perspective of the African diasporic media, because that's the, my, my specialist area. And the, the problem that they go through, um, skills sh shortage is one of them. And we've been talking about retraining people and, and, and giving them the skill. And there is also skills flight, because as you are training them, they are also moving to the mainstream. The mainstream will you know, snatch them and all sorts of things like that. So we need to make them at least happy working for the African diasporic media to be able to do a good job. There are also other issues to do with advertising revenue, you see. Now, you know, there are many things that are going on, politics behind the scene, whereby you find the African diaspora is struggling to actually get the right advertising revenue. Only when the government feels that, oh, oh, by the way, we need to talk to the minority group, you see, then just put a couple of uh, advertisement in their newspaper. It shouldn't be. It should be something that we, we can at least lobby for. And I think the African diaspora uh, uh, media should come together more and share resources as well. I did mention this in my book as well, because after going around to 
uh, the, the radio station, the big TV station that they have, and the press, and also, I see that there is a lot of synergy which they are not tapping into. Everybody has got their own ghetto. They just work in, in silos. So that should stop. They do a lot of gate watch, watching, and gate watching means that they are not generating their own authentic stories. You see, so they monitor the BBC Channel 4, this and that and that, and then couple things together and things like that. You know, who, who want to listen to you? That's a, that's a, you know, a dead story already because you are, you are telling something that people know about. So there are issues to do with credibility and trust, okay? How do we enhance that credibility? Even among the people in the diaspora, when you tell them, oh, can, have you read this particular newspaper? <laughs> But if you say about Guardian or something like that, they are much more open about, yeah, Guardian is fantastic. I, I read Guardian every day. But what about the one that is talking about talking to them? They, they are not doing that. So brand loyalty is important. And collaborative you know, effort, journalism, is also very, very important. And back to what we are saying about you are setting up a social media platform and things like that. It's a collaborative project where the journalists can come on board as well, and then ordinary citizens who are interested can come on board to be able to do it. But if we start something, if we model something in the diaspora, it will be a showcase to the rest of the world. You see the point? And then people in Africa can also wise up to it and say, oh, so it can be done differently, rather than pulling them in Africa. So we are a lot in the diaspora already. Let's pull our resources together and do something that you know, we can be proud of, that can rival the likes of uh, Al Jazeera. Even BBC should be proud of it and things like that, rather than having these small, small you know, ghetto things. Wonderful. Further questions from across a lot? Can we, um, can we come up here and then over there and then we'll probably come to you, George? Um, hi, my name is Stephanie Kitchen. Hello, Stephanie. I want to ask the panel uh, to comment on the role of the state a big question, apologies. But I do think it's the missing element in this discussion. You know, we've heard an outstanding speaker from the BBC, we've heard about Francophonie, we've heard about Le Monde's African um, website, which the French give funding to their newspapers. I understand the South African Broadcasting Corporation is state-funded. I'm doing parallels with higher education where state-funded is still a critical leg in, in all of this. I'm no expert, I work in print publishing, so... Um, I, it's just a sort of observation, or whether we want a more Al Jazeera sort of funding model for these sorts of African media initiatives. I guess that, that's what I'm thinking about. Um, I'm not convinced that micro payments are going to pay our journalists in Nigeria. Right? You know, I, I think it's, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Magnus, yours was the suggestion of micro payments. Did you want to respond to that? I mean, how, the, you know, and, and also the role of the state. Um, well, in, in the region that I know best, which is Eastern Africa, um, the s state media is... The, the biggest uh, media outlet is called Nation Media, which is not a state media outlet. It's essentially a, a business of the Aga Khan. Um, it, whilst it's not a state media outlet, it's definitely influenced by the state. Um, they have newspapers in Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania, a big, a big empire, and... The, they're very careful uh, to watch the way in which they operate to not compromise uh, how much, you know, how the business operates. So, for example, when in um, two years ago, the monitor in Uganda got in a lot of trouble, something that Richard Dowd and my boss mentioned earlier, um, about printing a letter by a kind of renegade general about a plan to put the president's son in power after, uh, after Ms. Evany goes... The paper was closed down, um, trashed. Uh, so the people who run the whole nation media group, essentially uh, based in Kenya, the suggestion is they got together, um, they, they discussed with Museveni what could be done, and one of the key uh, managing editors, a guy called Daniel Kanalaki, was, was pushed out. He, wasn't, he didn't leave the nation media group. He got a job in Kenya, a very nice job in Kenya, He's not doing very much work. He's not operating as an investigative journalist. He's being paid quite well. Um, so what I thought was quite interesting about that story is the way in which the business and the business of journalism um, uh, kind of conflict in that way and in which the state wants to be seen to be allowing journalism to run uh, in the way it should do. So we've got a free press, but it doesn't want it to be too free. 
So there's a tension in there. Uh, and um, th what was mentioned earlier about um, this kind of big business that might um, provide funds for people to do journalism. Well, what you need is for people to be to, to buy the idea that journalism exactly. is a good thing in itself. Exactly. And I'm not convinced that across, uh, particularly in East Africa, which is where I know best, uh, potentially relatively illiberal state machinery really believes in the idea that the media in itself is a good thing and makes countries better. Um, it does to an extent, but not too much. Yeah. Please. Please. Um, the state has a role to play. They are stakeholders, and we are, if we are ever going to resolve the Africa, the African story, the ownership of the African story, we must work together. I think for me, strategic partnership with the state is critical. We also have to build relationship between the political class and the journalism. That journalists are not particularly enemies of the state. Okay, so there has to be that relationship between the two, and of course, um, particularly in sort of formulating the policies to ensure that journalists can operate in a conducive environment. So it has certainly a, a, a very big stake to play. I see in Kenya um, the government paying for peer services, you know, if they invested that money in journalism in being able to tell what they're doing, you know. So I think they have a role to play and they can actually fund journalism. I think that's the way Can I go. just ask a question? Is, is the government in Kenya one of the biggest advertisers? Absolutely. In order that, so they, they may not be running the newspapers, but they're certainly contributing indirectly a lot of money towards the media process. So if they were to withdraw their advertising from the Daily Nation, that's a very bad thing for the papers. So, so it, it, it implicitly moderates the editorial line. Magnus, so there has to be healthy relationship. One cannot operate independent of the other. I think they have to relate, and, and I think every one of us, as we've discussed, we have a role to play. The political, African politicians are constantly talking about the African image, you know, the Western media not representing them. And I think if we work around it and, and, and build relationship, I think it will, it will sort of be positive for everyone. Very quick point, Sylvia. Uh, yes, please. There is something we must understand, is that the state in Africa in the 20th century was never built to serve the interest of the populations. It's a long debate, but this is, this is the reality. This is the reality. Now then, the way forward is for us to understand that we cannot afford to look at the state as the only source of salvation. And we cannot either afford to look at the state as our enemy that we need to destroy. What we need is what I called in one paper, the Building Africa Vision, because these people who are in power, they are not necessarily bad people uh, any worse than us. It's just that they have never, ever been trained to uh, uh, empower African people and to build Africa. That's why, despite all the millions that we, we know that exist, it, the Chinese are the ones who are founding the African Union. How, how can that be possible? So the way forward then is for us to establish healthy partnerships with whoever is prepared to help us implement our agenda. That's the main thing. So if it is money that we need, there are business people, and I tell you, really right, well-behaving business people who can help. The, and if there is a bad one, a business person fears only one thing, that is public shaming. And if we have an action plan that we want to implement, be it with uh, some states that are well behaved like Mauritius, we can then adopt Mauritius as a model that can be replicated all over Africa. But if we sell that case to all, uh, other African states that we already have a, a means to put pressure on them, I tell you, things are going to change within five years. The gentleman up there has been waiting. Thank you. I'm Cyril from the University of Limerick, Ireland, and recently now saw us, um, CAS to be precise. Uh, my the question is, do we have people here, or Africans in the diaspora, as we say, who are willing to sacrifice for the next five years to bring to fruition any kind of conclusion we can make now. I, I just give a short example, I'll try to be brief. 
There was an agenda to let the people decide in South Sudan. And that was the agenda, let the people decide. 50 years of war, more than enough, let the people decide. And I was part of that group. We were there for five, six, ten years, and we set up ten radio stations after a big pilot project just to look for the best way to get people to achieve a certain level of civic education so that they can decide. Okay, I know there's somebody from the South Sudanese Embassy here and so on. But it was not a conspiracy, but it was a deliberate media attempt. Let the people decide. Most of those who funded this project were private individuals. You could have one or two families from Italy or from America, and they paid to set up a whole radio station having a capacity for more than 300 kilometers radius. I don't know how many hundred thousands of dollars. The money came from everywhere. After talking like this, we are not able to decide. People were putting up their hands. Will you be able to sacrifice for five years your time, your money, to bring something like this, maybe media for education for Africa? Forget about all the dancing and the... And the and so <laughs> media for education, media for health for Africa. Five-year strategic plans, volunteers to come on board, willing to travel, willing to pay for your expenses and sacrifice for five years, you achieve something. But not after talking like this, when it's time to sacrifice, everybody's asking how much, where is the location, and it, is, and it doesn't work. So many of us are into research and so on. The ideas are clear. We need people who will be ready to sacrifice. I'm on board. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Vincent Gassan again. I just, I'm just wondering, first principles really, it, it's um, all stories are local essentially. When we talk of international stories that are local to somebody. And there is a tendency when we're speaking about Africa to want to cut and paste. Um, this is the media, this is journalism, how it should be. And, and I think um, Magnus touched on it um, in that stuff is coming from outside. And um, do people really care if a newspaper disappears, if a radio station disappears? If you go to, um, if you look at you know, an organization like the BBC, it grew organically out of the history and culture of this country. If you go into um, any African country and you ask most media practitioners their idea of what, how to serve their, their locality, most of them would be slightly confused because they don't go inwards and bring out stories. And I think we're talking so much about money, but we're not actually talking about, I mean, guys, you can look at it from an, an historical perspective. What does journalism mean to Africa? What is um, journalism as far as the ordinary African is concerned? And if that doesn't compute with people that are supposed to be served by these organizations, we can talk year after year after year for the next 50 years for the same thing. I mean, we, we, we're reinventing the wheel here. Um, the journalism in, say, in other countries um, developed with people doing their own private businesses here. They, um, some of them were, you know, things like uh, um, some of the crimes that journalists are falling foul of in African countries, you can trace right here. Um, we, we need to be able to think of an African media that starts from within and um, not just uh, looking at the localities, but actually in the context of an African uh, way of telling those stories. I mean, one example I'd like to give, I'm sorry I'm going on a bit, one example quickly I'd like to give. I mean, if you um, working for a news organization here and you go outside um, Downing Street and you sort of shout questions at David Cameron, whoever happens to be the Prime Minister. That's perfectly permissible. You know. Now, if you go to Africa and do exactly the same thing, they think you're crazy and they'll arrest you. And they'll be absolutely right in my view because you need to find a way that is um, within a context of that place of asking exactly the same questions. Now, unless we start engaging with that, there's no point going on about um, African media because what we have right now at the moment really isn't African media. But I, I, I would try to answer that by saying that that is a pretty kind of um, a, a very good criticism of, of the 20th century. But I think in the 21st century that, that there are, I mean, that few to many type of model of, of, of the media is something which is been pretty seriously eroded by the, the, the digital red revolution. And there are opportunities for many more people to engage 
in critical analysis of their government or of, of big business than there ever were a generation ago. And I can't even begin to imagine how that is going to transform opportunities for people going into the future. And that many-to-many -many kind of um, model of broadcast is something which I actually think is, is very intrinsically African. You say I'm a historian, but if you look back at the kind of the, the history of, 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 uh, of, of, of the way in which Africans kind of communicated their own narratives, that so many of those, it wasn't about a single record, it was about multiple oral testimonies, all which were contested and dynamic. And, and I think that there is, there is, um, there is a way in which the, what the digital era, era will allow is for something which many Africans will, I think, will find much more kind of akin to the sorts of traditional ways in which um, communication actually operated. I think that there's a real opportunity here. Uh, thank you, Gus. Um, I can tell you again. Um, I just want to talk about um, what Sylvia has been uh, discussing yeah. and what the gentleman said at back there. I want to say something. The first question we should ask ourselves, the local African media organizations, who own them? I'll talk about my country, Nigeria. You talk about a nation newspaper. You talk about TVC. Who owns all those, all those uh, TV and radio stations? I, used, I, worked, I started working on Nigerian radio at the age of 15, but I left Nigeria in frustration because even radio stations and TV stations in Nigeria now are just like the way politicians acquire jets. Yeah. I have state governors who are my friends who will tell me that, look, yeah, after being the senator or whatever, I want to, there is even one of them who wants to set up a radio station in Abuja, Potako, or whatever. I, do you think I would want to go and work with that kind of person? Those are some of the things we need to ask ourselves. And then the question about South Sudan. I remember when this radio station started, I wanted to leave my comfort to go to Juba. I wanted to go there. That's why I'm happy that, that gentleman mentioned it. I don't want to live in London. I never wanted to leave Nigeria. But I will tell you, even President Obasanjo, you're talking about, there are so many things he said about Nigeria and Nigerians that at times I ask myself, is it worth dying for this nation? <laughs> I, I cried on Nigerian radio stations three times. I had to leave to come and do my PhD here. A lot of things happened. And that's why a lot of Nigerians or Africans are disillusioned about their countries. Even let's go to Kenya. The, the radio stations are owned by uh, President um, uh, Kenyatta's family. Not all like, of them. Like, yeah, like the main radio stations like the ones that are open now, with the Star Times uh, issue, the digital uh, issue. A lot of things are just wrong, because we, talk, we keep talking about local radio stations, the local who owns them? Let's ask ourselves those questions. Do I want to work with them? I but can tell you. Uh, carry on, I can yeah. tell you. You know, these businessmen or these politicians have an agenda. What is our agenda? They have mm. an agenda to, to maybe go into politics. If we have a united agenda and we have the money, then we can be, don't give up. I tell you not to give up, okay? Yeah. If we have a united agenda and we have the, the discipline and the confidence, they have the confidence that if they put their money mm. in, in the African media, they can achieve what they want, mm -hmm. right? So if you have an agenda and we have a shared agenda, then I'm sure we can. So don't, don't just complain and, and sort of give up. No, I, I, I urge you not to, because if we have a united agenda and we put our money, how much money do Africans diaspora send home? How can we tap that? How can we get all these private equities operating in the region and get them to invest in, a, in an outfit that represents us? Well, Agnes, that's exactly what I want to also point out. The, even the people you think you're fighting for, sincerely, they are the We're ones... We're not fighting for the, anybody, no. Yeah, because if everybody, like uh, Silver said, it's not as if we're fighting the politicians. I'm not fighting politicians, but even the people I feel I, I could die for. They disappointed me Sorry. because no. these are the can same I, people. And the, uh, for can the I first time, I must confess, Sylvie has been able to like, to 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 like reawaken the the sleeping giant in me. I want to like <laughs> join her to, to do something because this is the first time I will I will meet an African who is really ready to do something and showing passion 
about it because I must confess are I you, got are, tired. Are you going to be there as well? You're going to be there. Sorry, <laughs> that's you're going to be fast. there, standing shoulder to shoulder with Sylvia. That's, what I, that's exactly what I'm. I'm <laughs> going to get in touch with her. We're going to talk <laughs> about it. But I'm tired of Africans complaining, but they're not doing time, anything so with I, some of us. Can I, can I just um, sorry interject and just give me my own sort of um, uh, a point of view? I hope is shared by many. I think, first of all, the, one of the significant problems we have on the continent is the lack of a real civil society. Um, look at the Arab Spring. It started. You know, it's, I'm sure there were many times when many Egyptians or um, Tunisians were like you, totally frustrated. But somewhere, one day, they had enough, and one chap either got killed or bitten up, and that was it, it triggered, and the match was lit. The continent is not maybe quite ready for it. Either there's still issues of poverty, tribalism, we're fragmented, and our interests are not totally, totally at one. But there is, I think, a civil society in the diaspora. You respect, look around this room. I don't think anybody here is sitting here because they're Nigerian or Ghanaian or Sierra Leonean. We're Africans. And that's the power that we have outside the continent. We actually tend to think more as a unit. And that's where we can be more powerful. The Africa Center can be a platform used responsibly. We can. I didn't say there. I said it is less. I didn't say there was no civil society. I said, is, I said civil society is, is, is weak. Is, look, look at what's happening in Nigeria. I'm Nigerian. But the, the underlying point, though, is, is not... I obviously true. cannot make a generic... Um, I, it's not a sweeping statement. I am saying that a lot of the changes that you need in journalism, in, res, in, in responsible, investigated, in, independent journalism, would be there if there was a real ideology, if there was a real agenda being formed by civil society. In Nigeria, look at what's happened. Unfortunately, but nobody's prepared to die for anyone, and you're quite right. And, I, and that is what I mean. So maybe I'm not articulating it in the same way that you would, but I feel that outside, outside the continent, out in the UK, in the diaspora, we tend to think as Africans first. And that is the honest truth. And I think, therefore, all of the initiatives we're talking about around the table here are much more possible. And we can, and we can lead from here, we can start from here, whether it's through uh, us, you know, it's not so much about sacrificing and not earning a living. It may be an initiative where you actually talk to the, those who are younger and have more at stake and who have more time and who are maybe studying journalism and try and get it. I don't know what the, um, what the curriculum are like or what the, 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 they're studying in, in uni, but basically there might be a way to sort of, sort of you know, injecting some form of ideology you know, into the way that the youngsters here who are studying journalism and, and more Africans who are looking at the continent. So that when, and, and you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mini Silicon, silicon Valley here. You know, things can happen. You know, someone may decide to sit down and set up a radio station purely because of the fact that there is a gap in the market and there's something he needs to put right. And sometimes investors see that. And even if it starts from ideology, an investor may see that this is a meaningful project and may decide actually whether for sponsorship or investment to put their money and their time behind it. And that's all I, am, I have to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We actually run out of time, but one last question. So glad I get the last question. Um, so I just I wanted to make a little comment and then and then uh, ask a question. So I, I work with Magnus at the Royal African Society, and I just want to point out we've got we're launching a project called What's on Africa, and it's going to be an events listing site and a cultural blog focusing on the continent and the diaspora in London. And a lot of the coverage is going to be cultural journalism, a lot of what Bimpe referred to. So I'm very happy to work with lots of different partners. But one of the things we're trying to develop is a link with um, people on the ground in Africa. So we're working with the British Council to launch a cultural journalism mentorship project with uh, young journalists who are interested in, in focusing on areas of culture. I think a lot of the time, business gets a lot of support. Investigative journalism gets a lot of support. But the stuff that focuses on culture and creative economy doesn't get a lot of exposure. So I think that's, I'm very excited about this project. So just wanted to put that out there. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out is that I don't think we should do either Africa or the Africa diaspora a disservice in terms of the media, because there are quite a few things that have come up in, in recent years. There's media diversified, which obviously it focuses on issues of race a lot, but they are talking about um, the issues of representation and the way Africans and black people are represented. So I think there's a lot that we can, um, I agree with the whole idea of concerted effort, but I also wanted to say that a lot of that also has to happen on a personal level, and I'll put up my hand up and say I'm guilty of this. If I see a story in The Guardian which is objectionable, I don't write a letter to the editor. And I think we certainly need to do a lot more of that. And maybe what 
you might be doing, Sylvia, is to um, coordinate people in making sure that their letters and their um, outrage has an impact. Because if we look at the US, you have um, organizations like the NAACP and the Anti-Defamation League who have a very big impact on the media because of their objections. So those are, that's what I want to point out. And then the last thing I'd say is on development and the media. I think a lot of what Akintai is, is says is true. We need a lot more transparency in terms of who owns the media because we also need to find ways in which we can pressure those owners. Because actually, to Bimpa's point about the media in Africa, Nigeria has got a very, very vibrant media, but the truth of the matter is that the economic pressure is so strong that if a journalist goes to a theater review, they don't review it because it's a good play. They review it because you put something in the brown envelope. So we need to change that. Can I just... Uh, yes, quickly there to my brother. The, situ the situation is as follows. It's not about the fact that we don't write letters. No, no, no. That's not the issue. The issue is this. We absolutely do not even believe that we can make something out of what we already have. This is the basic problem. Now then, what are we talking about? We are talking about the fact that the impetus for the decolonization of Africa, whatever we, we, we call it, what happened in the 20th century, started here in the diaspora, not because the people in Africa on the ground were more stupid than the Nkrumah and those who studied here, but simply because they, the, the Nkrumah and the rest who were studying here had more means and also because the, 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 the colonial powers did not feel able to kill them. The, where the things have just then been caught is that we, this generation, from the 1980s onwards, it's as though we stopped uh, implementing a specific agenda. This is the, 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 the main thing. So my role will be to help people understand that whatever you want to do in your corner, it ha the, 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 the main point we are aiming at should be is this contributing towards the building and the development of our continent. So what I am saying is whatever project A, B or C wants to have, it's not my, 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 pro my problem to try to control that, not at all, I will die, no. But my problem will try to make everybody believe that it is possible. I tell you what, when I arrived here 10 years ago, you wouldn't believe it. I couldn't speak English. It's neither my first, nor second, nor third, nor even fourth language. It's my fifth language. But I was lucky enough to find one man called Tajuddin Abdul Rahim, who made me believe in myself. And from then, I am what you see today, presidents there and there and there and everybody wanting a peace. That was not meant to be me. And this is what I want us to understand here, that if we want to transform Africa, we can do it within a few years because we have all the natural resources. We are the richest continent in the whole, in the whole world. And number two, we have what is called already a, a path for us, which is that for centuries and centuries, we did not own our continent. Now this is our opportunity. What is it that we have to, to, to spend time talking instead of doing? I think that's the perfect way to end it. It's time to stop talking and to start doing. Okay.